to our Evidence Synthesis Ireland webinar series. And just by way of a brief introduction, as we're relatively new, uh, ESI, Evidence Synthesis Ireland, is an all-Ireland initiative funded by the Health Research Board and by the Research and Development Division of the Public Health Agency in Northern Ireland. And our aim is to build evidence synthesis knowledge, awareness and capacity on the entire island of Ireland. We have a number of key activities for achieving that aim, and one of them is this monthly webinar um, on an evidence synthesis topic. Um, I should also point out that ESI includes Cochrane Ireland. So each month we have a topic on something evidence synthesis related. And um, our host today is Professor James Thomas, and he's a professor of social research and policy at the Epi Centre in UCL in London. His research covers substantive disciplinary fields such as public health, education, computer and information science. Uh, he's written extensively on evidence on research synthesis, including methods for combining qualitative and quantitative research and reviews. He leads the systematic reviews facility for the Department of Health in England. Uh, his activities in computer science include implementing novel technologies and processes, including machine learning and crowdsourcing to improve the efficiency of systematic reviews. And he also uh, leads the development of the EPI reviewer software, which manages data through all stages of systematic review. So this particular webinar by James is going to examine some of the ways in which all those various information technologies can make reviewing more efficient and also increase the reliability of the process. And just before I hand over to James, if anybody would like to ask a question, uh, you can just um, select the question and answer section on the bottom menu and type your question in there. You can type your question during the presentation and then I'll ask them when we get to the end. Uh, I'll ask as many of them as time allows. And so that's all the housekeeping done. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to Professor James Thomas for this webinar on information technologies for reviewing. Off you go, James. <laughs> Thank you very much. And can, can I just check you can hear me? I can hear you. Can everybody else hear? If anybody has any problems at, at any point during the webinar, just type it into the either the chat part or the questions and answers. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation to talk to you this morning. Um, I started looking at, um, well, I, I was looking at the um, abstract that I wrote a few months ago now for this. And I realized I'd basically decided that we were going to cover everything in relation to information technologies for systematic reviews. Um, and so with that in mind, I've added a little bit of extra text to my title, as you can see there. I've called it Information Technologies for Systematic Reviews, the Past, the Present, and the Future. Um, what I tend to do these days is talk more about the future. Um, and it was quite an interesting exercise recently then, sort of being um, prompted to think about the past and the present as well in relation to the future. So I'm going to give you quite a high level tour and quite a personal tour really um, over my history of doing uh, systematic reviews. Um, I've been doing systematic reviews for 20 years at least. Um, up at that point, I've, I've kind of lost count. Um, I've done lots of different reviews in lots of different areas. Um, and I've sort of seen evidence synthesis move from um, it's early days um, in the 90s to what it looks like now and it's, you know quite a lot of changes over time and a lot of these changes from my perspective have been related to information technologies or rather both information technology has influenced how we have done um, systematic reviews and also systematic reviews have influenced the way that evidence uh, the way that technologies have developed so without further ado I'm going to see if I can advance my slides Yes, I can. Great. Okay, so first of all, I must acknowledge that what I'm going to talk about today is the work of many people, probably more people than are listed here. I've also got to acknowledge my declaration of interest. I'm interested in everything here. I'm employed by University College London, um, and I lead the Epi Reviewer Software Development. So I've got quite a, um, a simple outline for what I'm planning to talk about at the moment, um, thinking about the past and the presence of tools for systematic reviews, so sort of how we've got to where we are at the moment, and also thinking about um, highlighting a couple of the tools that maybe you don't know about at the moment, but which are ready for use and which you might want to try out. So uh, that's the first part of what I'm going to talk about. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the emerging future. Um, and a couple of examples of what I'm thinking of as infrastructural change. Um, and I won't say much more about that yet because that's going to be what the focus of what I talk about when I get there. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the various stages of a systematic review through from searching for studies, screening, um, mapping, data extraction, risk of bias assessment, um, synthesis, that, those kinds of steps, um, and just think about where we were and where we are at the moment, um, and then I'm going to think about where we are going to. So those of you who have been in the business as long as me will remember the past. Um, there were relatively few bibliographic databases. We didn't just search PubMed and the like. Um, there was a heavy emphasis on identifying the right journals and the right people to contact in order to find um, relevant studies for including in a review. This term hand searching was very prevalent, it was very um, important. And you know, a lot of the time we would we would go and hand search. We would literally go to the journals in the libraries and we would look through them by hand, um, which often reviews don't do at all anymore. But it was one of the one of the most frequent ways of finding studies in the early days. Um, and when we talked about we talk about full checks retrieval now, we often mean um, obtaining the PDF of a paper, for example. Um, back in the day, this was often actually going and getting the physical papers into library loans, photocopies. Um, we used to walk around and get the tube around London from library to library to go and get the papers for retrieving for reviews. So things have changed. We've changed quite a lot in terms of the way that we search for studies um, in that we now use structured Boolean searches of lots of different bibliographic databases um, and sort of accompanying this progression into the, sort of like the availability of these big indexes of databases such as Embase, PubMed, Sinal and the like um, has been an explosion in the quantity of research as well. Um, and that's meant really that we have been dealing with a terrible signal to noise ratio in terms of what we're finding in our reviews. Um, we don't like to miss relevant studies, which means that we carry out very sensitive searches and we retrieve sometimes thousands of potential really relevant studies. Most of them are not relevant and we spend a lot of time going through them manually. Um, checking them for relevance. Um, in order to address some of this problem, we've um, invested in the development of search filters. Um, and what we're seeing now is increasing use of other uh, sources of data in reviews. So we've been therefore having to search other places such as trial repositories, identification of other gray literatures, um, clinical study reports and the like. So that's searching at the moment and most of you will be familiar with the tools. Um, and most of the tools for searching, I should say, really are generic um, tools for searching. I don't know really of, of, of any big um, major tools which are designed specially for systematic review searching. That's not the case for the other tools that we're gonna be talking about. So when we're thinking about casting our minds back to screening. Um, it wasn't actually the time consuming process it was today, or at least it's a slightly different time consuming process. It often happened while we were hand searching, we'd be looking down the, um, the tables of contents of journals. Um, there were relatively few bibliographic records screened in desk based desktop bibliographic software. So EndNote, ProSite Reference Manager, et cetera. The present in terms of screening is very different in that there's a very strong emphasis now on the manual screening of thousands of bibliographic records that I've mentioned. Um, I estimated um, not so long ago that um, there are around 30,000 um, systematic reviews indexed in the epistemonic cost databases over the last couple of years. Um, and if you take the average number of studies screened to be around 3,000, which it is for Cochrane reviews, that equates to a staggering 75 million records that were screened in order to write those reviews. Um, and obviously those of you who are um, familiar with some of the Messier standards and other standards um, recommended is that we double screen um, everything, which means up to 150 million records are being screened every year by systematic reviewers. And that's just in health. Obviously, there are systematic reviews in other areas too. So there's a lot of effort that's going in um, to identifying the studies. Um, there's some author contact. I would say that it's it's still it still happens, but it's probably slightly less less. Um, important because of the big bibliographic databases that we've got now. We obviously also check reference lists, which I should have mentioned we do before. Um, and we're starting to use machine learning to make things a little bit more efficient. But for many um, reviewers, this is in the future still. So 
in terms of tools, um, the past, um, and those of you uh, who are still using these for softwares for screening, I know that these are the present as well. Um, we used bibliographic software um, on the whole. We would, we would import or we would type in manually the references and we would screen them through. Um, and I know that that's still a present, but I think that we're moving towards um, more bespoke, more online web-based software, which is designed specially to support systematic review needs and workloads, where we've got multi-users using the software concurrently, um, and we've got more constraints in tagging. And what I mean by that is that some of the bibliographic um, tools enable you to add tags or keywords to studies, but um, the, the sort of review, the software which is designed for reviews um, can constrain those. You, do, you can't sort of mistype include or exclude, for example, um, and the, the, like, the, the workflow is supported by the decisions that you make um, and the tags that you add to studies. And so systematic review software um, has got specific support for systematic review tasks. So discrepancy resolution, um, assignment of work to reviewers and that kind of thing. So many of you will be aware of some of the browser-based tools that are being used specifically for systematic reviewing. Um, there's a list of them there, Cadmo, Covidence, Distiller, EpiReviewer, Hawk, Ryan, um, Schrift, and the Swift um, reviewer are probably the, probably the main ones that I, that I know about. However, there has been some um, work in terms of using machine learning and text mining to um, identify studies for inclusion in reviews at this stage and to help with the screening process. And I've included this in the present part of um, this little presentation because it is a functionality that is present in many um, tools now. For example, Abstracker, EpiReviewer, Ryan, um, and I think Distiller as well now. So there's, a, there's, a, there's increasing support for using machine learning here. Um, and I've put here, it's received the most R&D attention. What I mean by that is out of all of the different tasks in a systematic review that machine learning can help with, citation screening has really been the one where most effort has been put. Um, it's difficult to compare evaluations because people have done evaluations using different data sets. Um, but the overall message from these um, valuations really is that you can reduce workload possibly by quite a lot um, and that it's actually quite a useful process to use even if you don't actually use uh, the machine to decide um, whether a particular item is relevant or not but simply a, a method of prioritizing the order in which you screen things and I'll show you that a, I've got a picture of that in a second so I'll just talk you through quickly how it works because um, it's a sort of like an iterative process whereby the machine learns iteratively from the way that um, reviewers, humans are manually looking at records. So in stage one here, the um, citations or the bibliographic records are entered into the database. And then an initial set is screened manually. It doesn't have to be very big, but you do need some examples of what you are looking for, so relevant studies as well as some examples of what you don't want. Um, once you have those, we can move on to stage three where the machine learning is trained. And what happens there is that the decisions that you've made so far, it might only be a handful of studies, um, are fed into a machine classifier and it builds a statistical model. Um, which really aims to distinguish the features, so the words that you use, that are used in those titles and abstracts, the ones which are relevant compared with the ones which are irrelevant. And what it then does is um, it then ranks everything else in the um, which has not yet been screened. So that's the second part of stage three. First of all, we build a, a machine learning model and then we rank everything in terms of likely relevance according to the machine learning. And then the author then, or the reviewer, um, will then look at the top of that list manually. Maybe the top 25 seems to be um, an average number for this. Um, 
and once they've looked at the top 25 we've got 25 more um human labels as they're known so we've got 25 more studies which we know whether or not they're relevant or irrelevant so we hop back to stage three and we build a new model with a little bit more data in it we re-rank everything we've not screened and we start the process again so we look at the top 25 we then go back to stage three with a little bit more data and so as the reviewer screens and as the machine learns the idea is that the relevant studies are found um, much more quickly and they have sort of looked at the, the beginning of the screening process rather than further towards the end. And as I've got at the bottom here, it can work quite well. So these are some example reviews from the Cochrane Heart Group where we've got screening process along the bottom of the um, if, along the x-axis there and the cumulative number of studies found uh, along the y-axis. Um, so if you were screening at random, you would expect a diagonal line going from the bottom left up to the top right. And as you can see in these, um, these are simulation studies on completed reviews. Had they used this process of machine learning, they would have found the relevant studies very quickly. So for example, there's 15,000 studies in this middle um, review, 1006 here. Um, the machine learning found all the relevant ones after screening around 400 of them rather than 15,000. So it's possible potentially to find the relevant studies very early in the screening process. Now there's useful for two purposes. One is that you've therefore got your hands on those relevant studies very quickly and you can move to full text retrieval and other parts of the review um, much earlier than you would otherwise have been able to do, even if you then still want to look at all the rest of the tail. The real challenge with using this at the moment is that we don't have uh, what's called a stopping criterion. We don't actually know um, when we've found all of the relevant studies and you can see from these different graphs they've got slightly different shapes so whilst with some of them you might be safe after screening only maybe 10% of the items for for example the one on the bottom right it took the machine a lot longer to find all of the relevant studies there and so you would need to keep screening um, for a bit longer so current work is in place um, in terms of um, being able to determine where you are in terms of one of these curves um, at any one particular point in time before you've got all the way to the end. I've got a question here I can see from Connor. Um, what features do the machine learning algorithms use? Ha, okay, uh, without getting too much into the tech technicalities of it, um, we're using, for this process, we tend to use um, support vector machines as the machine learning classifier, and we're using the titles and the abstracts, and we tokenize those, and we um, take um, trigrams of the, of the um, titles and abstract, which means sort of individual words, pairs of words, and triplets of words, and those are what we use in order to train the machine learning. So once we've got some of the studies that we're interested in, in the review, um, we want to describe what they are often. This is, there's increasing interest in this, um, the idea of mapping or gap maps as products in their own right. But we also find them as useful intermediary stages in a review. Um, when we're often working with policymakers, for example, that we might have quite a broad question to begin with. And what we'll do is we'll do quite broad searches and we'll keyword the studies we find, and then we'll create these maps of the research in order to then go and have a dialogue um, to talk about actually where the, where the priorities are. Um, there are relatively few tools, but I thought it would be nice to highlight one for you here. So I'm going to pull up a tool here. Hopefully you can see this now. This is um, a Campbell collaboration um, gap map. It's on child welfare. And this is the result of the systematic search um, screening and keywording process. And what we can see is along the top, we've got outcomes and along the um, the side there we've got various interventions and what it shows us is the distribution of research activity so for example we can see that some outcomes mortality morbidity are quite well covered cognitive development quite a lot less for example and nothing here on antenatal postnatal care etc um, we can click into various um, parts of the map and we can look at some of the studies in more detail and we can get links out to um, find the papers themselves and so this is 
a useful representation of the research literature. It's a useful communication tool um, and it can help commissioners determine what should be um, commissioned next. And it can also be a useful stage in terms of deciding um, and planning future systematic review activity. So if we know that we're in a situation where there's lots and lots of studies, um, then we can plan our resources accordingly. So maps and this tool here um, is, is one of those tools which is designed specifically to support evidence synthesis. And the way it works is it works out of Epi Reviewer where you can do some keywording with an Epi Reviewer and then export it to generate, generate these maps. So I will minimize that for now. So in terms of data extraction, to thinking about past and present of data extraction, historically we've tended to use generic software, Word, Excel. Um, there's more heterogeneity now, lots of people still use Word and Excel and the like, um, but we're moving more to using some of those bespoke online systems that I mentioned before. Likewise, in synthesis, um, we're thinking about past and present again, um, but there's even more heterogeneity of tools, I think. Um, there's more desk-based tools, and um, the tools tend to be quite bespoke to the type of synthesis. Um, but there are some online tools available, and I thought I would highlight two for you. Um, first of all, um, Network meta-analysis is becoming increasingly popular and increasingly valued by decision makers. Um, it's now one of the core methods in the Cochrane Handbook um, that will be published later this year. And the reason for this is twofold. One is that methods and tools are developing and there's a nice confluence of methodological development alongside um, an awareness that actually decision makers often need to choose between various intervention options. So they don't want simply a, um, an intervention A versus placebo because that doesn't help so well with a decision which is, do I choose intervention A, B or C or D, where network meta-analysis is able to address that question a little bit more um, directly. So from the Complex Review Support Unit, there is the Meta Insight tool. Oh, I seem to have timed out from the server since I loaded the page. I'll load it up again. And those of you who are interested in trying meta analysis and, um, and, and just sort of getting into the area, this is a nice way of, of, of getting into it because it's, it's an online tool. You don't have to run wind bugs or anything um, on your desktop. You can, it, this, this tool will help you get into it. So I do recommend um, taking a look at it. You basically get some, some nice instructions in terms of loading up data. There's some example data there and you, it'll run the analysis for you in the background. Um, and so, so long as you've got data in the right structure, um, you, can, you can run a meta-analysis, a network meta-analysis ra rather now online um, with a lot less pain than you um, might otherwise have experienced um, had you tried to um, or need to program R or WinBugs um, in order to do this for you. So um, it, those of you who are potentially interested in, in, in gaining new skills in network meta-analysis, this is a tool which takes some of the pain out of, of, the, of the information technologies that you would otherwise have to engage with. The other tool I thought I would show you, um, those of you who are um, especially doing Cochrane reviews in qualitative research, um, you'll know probably that Epi Reviewer has supported qualitative synthesis for a while. Our new uh, Epi Reviewer web tool um, is now moving to be able to support this as well. And this is an example now um, of the web interface. We've now got PDF file support just coming through and this is now the test version, so it's not yet live, but we can do things such as sort of highlight pieces of text and associate them with codes. This is a, this is a systematic review about um, body size, shape and weight. And so I've sort of thinking about bullying and, and et cetera, and sort of social isolation and that kind of thing within this review. And I can highlight bits of text and I can associate that with particular codes. Um, and this really helps in a, in a qualitative environment where we're basically treating the text, the PDF text as data, the findings as data in their own right. Um, as what we can then do is um, go through, and I was talking about a piece about bullying, wasn't I? So we can pull up the bullying subcode, for example, 
and get a report on that. And then what I'm able to do, once this has popped up here, there we go, um, is to get a report which tells me about those codes, but looking across all the different papers. So I can identify the same codes with thinking about sort of like the sub subcategory of bullying. Um, and I can see what text has been associated with that code across lots of different papers. And that's a real help in terms of helping me sort of think and construct um, a synthesis um, in this area. Minimize that. Okay, so moving into the future, and this is where um, we start to sort of see some quite major and what we might think of as disruptive change that will be coming. So it's definitely, as well as sort of thinking about the current tools and the current technologies, there are some new tools and technologies and ways of working just around the corner. And I've, I've sort of thinking about searching and screening. Um, we, we tend to think of them as fairly sort of separate and discrete activities. We search for stuff, we retrieve it all, and then we start looking through it. And I think what we're going to see is this is much more integrated. We're going to be thinking much more in terms of different methods of study identification. Um, we're also going to see an accompanying de-emphasis on journal articles. Um, they're always going to be important, but if you're thinking about um, using other types of data, individual participant data, clinical study reports, um, looking at trials repositories, we're going to have to sort of cast our net wider in order to find um, the research that we're looking for. Um, and really, uh, that number that I talked about earlier, the 150 million studies being screened every um, year by systematic reviewers, we've got to do something about reducing that screening effort. And so I've got an example for you now of a service which went live within Cochrane um, literally a matter of a few weeks ago. It's called the Screen for Me service. And this is a uh, workflow that uses three technologies in order to reduce um, manual effort and to reduce duplication of effort. And we've, we've moved into a different um, uh, appearance on the slides here um, because these slides were created by Anna Noll Stoor. So the three technologies that we're using here are what are called known assessments, the RCT classifier and the Cochrane crowd. Now I'll, I'll just talk about those three technologies first before I show you the workflow. The known assessments is an attempt to address the duplication of effort problem that I mentioned. Um, the Cochrane um, Central Register, as many of you know of, of trials, contains um, over a million records now. Um, and the Cochrane crowd has screened over half a million records of, of um, the results for sensitive search for RCTs. And um, this data usually we would, be, would be discarded in the context of a systematic review. But actually, it's incredibly valuable in its own right, because we've now got a, a systematically uh, labeled and very reliable data sets of over half a million records, which we know are not RCTs. Um, and we really should make better use of that. So what we want to ensure we do is we build cumulatively on the screening effort that's carried out and where we've already decided whether or not a given record is or isn't an RCT, we should make use of that knowledge when we see that record again. The other output and the other outcome of having a large data set which um, either does or doesn't describe RCTs is the ability to build machine learning classifiers. So what I did with this was to build a classifier which can distinguish between randomized and non-randomized trials. It's called the RCT classifier. Um, it was built on 280,000 records um, from Cochrane Crowds and it was calibrated um, in um, collaboration and consultation with the information um, methods, information retrieval methods group to achieve a recall of 99%. What that means is that it's quite a cautious classifier in that it will include stuff which actually isn't an RCT, retrieve at least 99% of the RCTs um, that are passed through it. Um, when we passed all 94,000 um, included studies from Cochrane Reviews through it, uh, we end up with a recall of around 99.6%. So we know it's a high performing classifier. And the other technology is Cochrane Crowds. I've got a slide or two on that, so I'll talk about that now. 
So for example, for a start, if those of you who haven't tried Cochrane Crowd, do sign up. Um, you can make a difference. It's a platform for crowdsourced uh, micro tasks. Um, essentially so this task we're thinking about whether or not a given bibliographic record does or doesn't describe an RCT. So this is an example of the user interface. Crowd members are shown a um, title and abstract and are invited to decide whether or not it does or doesn't describe an RCT. And there are 12 or 13,000 people now in the crowd. So um, the crowd is really quite large and able thanks to a sort of like an algorithm that operates behind the scenes, um, able to distinguish between RCTs and non-RCTs very, very accurately, both in terms of recall, the identification of RCTs over 99%, and um, precision, so the ability not to call things RCTs if they're not of over 99%. There's a little animation there. Um, and this is an example of the known assessments that I was mentioning before. These are some... Um, reviews from 2016 I think um, and what we can what we can see on these bars here the, um, the the darker blue bars the ones on the left are the ones are the number of records retrieved for each uh, review from Embase and then the payloads are like the purple bars on the right for each review are those records which had already been screened by the crowd. An average of 83% of those records had already been screened by the crowd so we already knew for a lot of those reviews whether most of those records were or were not randomized trials. We're also using the machine and the crowd together. Um, you can see in terms of the amount of um, throughput of records um, going forward, we can see that sort of like the previous model with um, information specialists searching and screening, um, we're able to process around 50,000 records a year. The Cochrane Crowd itself in 2016 got that up to 150,000. And now with the crowd and the machine, obviously a bigger crowd as well, we're processing, um, getting on for 300,000, probably more now. So we're able now, um, and well, this is one of the real sort of key points of the um, of this little talk, is that we're taking Uh, James, I don't know if you can hear me, but we can't hear you anymore. Um, I'll just, I'm going to, I'll message him as well uh, to all the participants and I'll let you know what's happening. Okay, so he's he's dropped off, and I'll just I'll I'll relink him up again. So bear with me, and we will have him back in a minute. I hope, <laughs> but we will. Okay, everyone, he's coming back. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, you're back. Hi. You're okay. We Sorry, talk. About, sorry about that. No worries. I'd say it's your internet connection, James, because you, the sound is coming and going a little bit. Oh, no. Sorry about that. I didn't know. No, um, okay. We can hear you now again. When, when did I disappear? Just, literally just uh, on that last slide. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. That's because Zoom suddenly did a funny thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Right, okay, so I'll start from the top of the slide. So um, we basically start, we can conduct our usual searches, and then once they're uploaded into the system, we're able to then start to make use of these pre-existing decisions. Have these records previously been assessed? And as I said, we've got an increasing number of records where we've already assessed these, already assessed whether or not records are describing RCTs. If they're not, we can just pop them into this bucket here, and these aren't RCTs. If we already know that they're randomized trials, they can follow this little workflow down to the end. We know they're RCTs. If we haven't seen them before, 
So this one's in the middle here. We go through the machine learning classifier. Are they very unlikely to be RCTs? If the machine learning classifier doesn't think they are, then it pops them into the output here. These are not RCTs. Following further down, the records that might be RCTs according to the machine learning classifier go into the crowd. Um, and the crowd then determines whether or not they are, and the non-RCTs go up here, and the RCTs move down into the end here. And so what this service offers authors is the ability to do their, um, their normal searching, do their normal um, um, uploading of references, for example, into the system, um, but then to go through this workflow, and at the end, only have the subset of studies um, which are RCTs. So that is actually quite a significant reduction in screening effort um, and hopefully um, in terms of speed of, of, re of reviewing and also um, just a sort of reduction in duplication of effort. So the same records are not being looked at time and time again and the same decisions being made of them. So um, I'm really quite optimistic about um, the the impact of a workflow like this, um, just in terms of being able to free up people's time to focus on the more interesting parts of the review and not to keep duplicating our work, looking at the same records over and over again. Okay, so that's screening, thinking about mapping research activity. What we're thinking here in terms of is being able to um, automatically identify clusters of research and automatically identify where the gaps are. Um, this relies on what's called clustering technology where groups of studies which use similar combinations of work can be clustered together. Um, the, the disadvantage with using tools such as this are often that you have no control over the way in which um, the, the studies are classified. So for example here I've got my last live example here. Um, this is an, an outcome of some automatic, um, what's called topic modeling. And these are the studies that were included in reviews in the pregnancy and childbirth um, set of reviews. Um, I've asked them to generate some topics. And we've got this nice little visualization on the left, which shows us the relatedness of topics to one another. So I've got topic six here selected at the moment and I can see the important words on the right in this little cluster of documents. Um, essentially these are about smoking cessation in pregnancy. We can see that here. If I click on topic 20 next to it I can see these are around incentives um, but they're also around smoking cessation which is why they overlap and why they're you know they're, they're pictorially so close to the um, to the one to the, the larger or the larger topic on smoking cessation. So we can see these are on incentives and smoking cessation in pregnancy. Um, if I hop over to the left here, what I find is a whole load about maternal nutrition. Lots of studies, lots of reviews all about um, nutrition, folic acid and the stuff, that sort of thing. If I hop down to the bottom here, I can see a whole load on um, neonatal and nu nutrition and feeding and that kind of thing. And over on the right, I can see studies which are sort of more um, about home visiting and that kind of thing. And so what this has enabled me to do very quickly, it only took um, a few seconds for this to run. I, I entered all of the studies that were in those reviews and it's, and it's given me a visualization which shows me the relatedness and also this, like the most important topics in, in those reviews. Um, the disadvantage is that I can't actually tell it which topics I want it to find, it's just found those topics for me automatically. But in the future, um, these are, I think some of these tools we're going to increasingly need as more and more research becomes available, we're going to need automatic ways of, of describing and classifying what we've got in front of us. So that's uh, one of that slide. So in terms of data extraction in the future, I think um, we're moving, and those of you who are familiar with the Cochrane work on PICO, we're moving quite quickly now to being able to think about classifying some classes of studies in terms of their PICO, so their population intervention, comparators and outcomes. Um, those of you who've used the robot reviewer tool will know that um, it's possible to estimate risk of bias characteristics from PDFs of randomized trials. 
Um, and the exact tool and some other tools that I know about are looking at extracting key information from the text, population, age, number of people in the studies, etc. Other work that's ongoing, though not yet deployed, is thinking about structured data from graphs and tables. So trying to help us save the, um, the slightly laborious, but also error prone task of retyping numbers from tables in order to calculate effect size estimates. But at the moment, these technologies are much less mature. So we are thinking about future here, um, but I think really what we should also take it to sort of um, take away from this is that there's quite an uneven distribution of technologies and development and activity at the moment in that you can see that for randomized trials we've got a really quite defined workflow we've got a big set of records um, which are already known and we have a machine learning classifier and we have a crowd task which is performing very very well and so for some classes of documents like that we've got some quite exciting um, developments coming through but we don't have the same activity across the boards and we, we don't have it for diagnostic test accuracy studies though we're doing some work and we'd like to qualitative research even less so one of the challenges we've got is thinking about um, how we ensure that um, lots of different, all different types of systematic reviews are able to take advantage of these technology developments. So thinking about con concluding so that we've got time for some questions and discussion. Um, in a picture, what I've seen over the years is that we've moved from a sort of like a paper-based um, set of technologies if you like um, into the pc into desktop technologies so we've sort of moved into a bibliographic software and analysis software based on our um, our desktops our laptops which we can carry around with us but increasingly now what we're seeing is technologies and data moving into the cloud um, moving online um, both in terms of the tools which support uh, systematic reviews but also the data and the, you know, the, the, the databases um, are increasingly large um, and increasingly that we, we can only use them when we're on the cloud. So I've been working this morning with a database of 200 million um, records and you know, that, that takes up more space than is available on my, uh, my desktop computer. So there are some things which we're having to do in the cloud because um, those are the only ways that which we can get those technologies to work at the type of scale that we're looking for. So I mentioned before um, around the sort of like the distribution not being evenly distributed. Now this quote from William Gibson, I think sums it up really nicely. The future's here, it's just not very evenly distributed. Um, we're moving towards in some areas, addressing some of those big information science failures um, in terms of making sure that we're looking after the research when it's published. Um, and we're attempting to reduce some of that duplication of efforts um, and also increase the connectedness of our, of our data and systems. Um, and so it's really sort of we've, we've moved we've moved a long way and we've moved there really quite quickly when I think about you know the days when we were going around libraries looking at um, journal papers through to the systems that we're using at the moment or some of us are using at the moment to online screening and thinking about the active learning or the priority screening that I was talking about um, into a, a future where if we can specify the PICO and pre-classify the PICO of the documents that we're looking at that really searching and screening will become quite different activities and we'll be able to focus our energies far more on um, the analysis the data extraction and the analysis um, and there we've got tools coming through again which should be able to make that process more efficient as well so i'm going to stop so that I'm, i've not got my little question window now so let's have to see if there are any questions um, but I'll just flag up here a couple of books. There's obviously the book that I was involved in editing, the Introduction to Systematic Reviews, and also the Cochrane Handbook for Systematic Reviews. The second edition is online on the Cochrane training site now. All the chapters are there, so do have a look at them. We'll be updating them soon with the um, copy edited versions. Um, we're working on a fully online open version of the handbook, and you'll be able to get your hands on the hard copy of the handbook um, from October onwards. So if you're thinking about Christmas presents for people, um, you can put that on the list. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, James. That was a, a really interesting and useful talk. And um, um, my head is whirling here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I'm of the hand searching era. That's how old I am. And um, I'm a total technophobe. So this kind of terrors me in some way. But I'm a systematic reviewer and I'm, it's very exciting. Because it looks like this information technology will really help not just with the workload of systematic reviewing, but also very much with the precision of what we're doing. Yes, I, mean, I think that's really what I'm, 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 I'm hoping we'll be able to do. Um, you know, one of the things that I've evaluating actually in the last couple of weeks has been the extraction of structured data from tables. We're quite a long way off having something which is going to work um, across lots of different table types yet, because we found so many weird and wonderful ways of, of, of presenting results in tables. Mm -hmm. But if we can get to a point where we don't have to retype it, I think that will be a big, big step forward. And the number of mistakes that are made um, when we're typing mm -hmm. from one, you know, retyping table content is, is horrible, which is why we have, you know, we have to double um, extract everything and, and that kind of thing. So if we can make it both quicker and more efficient, then I think that'll be a big step forward. The other thing is graphs. And we did a little evaluation of, um, of, of using a sort of like a specially designed tool for systematic reviews. Um, and that highlighted that we can really improve both the speed but the accuracy of extraction of, of numbers out of graphs. Um, and part of what, what was a slightly unexpected finding from that little study we did was just how inaccurate current systems are and current methods are. So we really do need to improve on that because the, the accuracy was really quite worrying. Um, but yeah, we've got, an act, we've got a tool under active development for that. So hopefully, um, but you'll, you'll be you'll be seeing that in a few months. Yeah. Um, can you, there is a question in there. Um, oh yeah. James, can you see them? Yep. Oh, okay. So Frank Frank Doyle's asked about the NMA tool. Um, it's frequentist at the moment. Um, they've talked about um doing a Bayesian. Um, it's it's more challenging techno you know technically to put that um online. Um, but it is it's definitely something that um they're interested in doing. And uh, any use of deep learning yet? Um, yes, we're using deep learning um, to classify um, studies according to their PICO. So if there's there's a big, um, if you go to linkdata.cochrane.org, I think, um, you can look at the PICO ontology. There are thousands of terms within the ontology and we're using deep learning to automatically um, identify um, sort of the, the PICO of, of randomized trials. That's been, a, you know, it's research and development and work in progress. But actually, um, those of you interested in deep learning, we've been starting to use the BERT tool um, and we're seeing some really um, good results from what's called transfer learning. So, um, yeah, watch this space. I think I think deep learning, though, you know, it's much more mature um, in the, the machine learning of images. Um, we're, we're starting to see some good results in text as well. Right. There's, an, there's another one there, uh, James from Theresa Moore asking, can you post a link to information about the data extraction tool you just mentioned? Um, oh dear, which data extraction tool was that? Was that the one, the, the one for qualitative analysis that I posted? Um, you can send them it? to me afterwards and I can send okay. them. I can yeah. send them with, with the um, post webinar survey thing. Sure, yeah. Yeah, if, 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 it was, if it was the little demo I gave of, of this tool here, then that's Epi Reviewer. If you Google Epi Reviewer, you'll find it. And this, um, the screening of, um, I'll show you the, the, where is it? There we go. The data extraction of PDFs is literally going live um, very soon. You can see actually this is called localhost. This isn't online. This is on my development machine. Um, and we're, we're just testing this at the moment. So it will go online within a matter of days or weeks now. Okay. She's, so she's saying. Oh, you're... numerical data. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, maybe that was the one I was talking about. Um, of, from tables, there's there's nothing yet. There's no no tool supports um, the automatic extraction of data from tables. That's that's current work work in progress. That's the future. That's the future. Yeah. That's the one Sorry. I'd love you. That's the one I'd love you to have as well. Oh. <laughs> We're working on it. Yes. Um, I just while I'm waiting, oh, there you go. Do you ever accept visiting PhD students? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we love having visiting PhD students. I'm just thinking, actually, James, as you're talking, does it sound like um, evidence synthesis, systematic viewing, is going to become something that only an elite few are able to do if we keep going down this route of lots and lots of technology? So, for example, I'm thinking of somebody like me, a novice reviewer, uh, a midwife by profession, uh, learning all the time and, and finding the systematic viewing difficult because I'm a novice. And I'm wondering, when it get, as it gets more and more and more complicated and people need more and more access to more and more technology, will it, I'm, I'm just wondering how it will still embrace novice reviewers. Yeah, I think it's, it's a fair question um, because, you know, systematic reviews have tended towards more complex as we've gone um, mm -hmm. forward. And you know, there's no doubt that network meta-analysis, for example, is, you know, is, is a steeper learning curve than um, pairwise meta-analysis, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, one of the things that I've been learning, uh, when, when we first, for example, put our um, screening using text mining and machine learning online, um, I was including all sorts of information in there because I thought that people would want sort of transparency about how the machine learning was working. And it was just too much information. Yes. Um, and actually, we can... Um, once we've done the R&D on these tools, we can start to put them more sort of in the background, this like the inner workings of them. Um, and so, what, you know, some of the, for example, the, the Screen For Me workflow, we, we, we're, we're sort of describing in, you know, quite a lot of detail at the moment. But, um, you know, the, what, what you can then end up with is a system where you just, you just give it some records or you, you know, even you search it and you say, I just want RCTs, please. And it will just give you them. And you don't have to sort of get involved in the sort of like the detailed mechanics of the process. Mm. Um, and so likewise, the PICO classification, when, we, when we've got that up and running properly, um, you know, if you're doing a systematic review, um, again, of effectiveness, um, looking at RCTs only at the moment, you know, this is where the tool is currently under development. Um, you know, you, you could just start the review by, say, by specifying your PICO. Um, and you know, the, your PICO with a type ahead, which then tells you um, which sort of terms um, and suggests terms to you. So actually, it could make it simpler in that you don't have to worry about all of the complicated um, Boolean searching that um, mm -hmm. you know we, we currently have to. You specify the PICO. It says, well, there are the studies for you, and off you go. And if, if we can get to a position where we've extracted some of the data for you as well, then you know so much the better. I think you know that the, there's uh, there's real blue skies work around automatically identifying and synthesizing um, studies. Um, I'm not sure, you know, how far we'll get with that. Certainly, you know, it's not going to be with us um, anytime soon. Um, and whether or not you want to remove um, the reviewer's judgment from the process entirely, I'm not sure. Yes. But, you know, in terms of the basics of finding the research that you're looking for. Um, the reason it takes so long and is so complicated at the moment is just basically um, globally, we, we manage to lose research. Um, we don't take good care of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's ridiculous how much we spend on research um, and then we just lose it and we spend all this time finding it again. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it is complicated, but I think this will make it simpler. You know, I, what I hope it'll enable you know patient groups to do will be able to identify the research in their area much more simply, yes, um, and much more quickly. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, no, hopefully we'll make it simpler. Hmm. Um, thank you enough for that. Now there's no more questions. Um, if anybody has another question, just type away. But I, I'll take this opportunity uh, when the question box is empty to say thanks to everyone who posed a question, and also thank you all for your patience with the slight technological glitch. Um, a huge thanks to James for all the time and effort in the presentation. I found it very useful and informative and I hope everyone else did as well. I'll put a recording up on the website later today so that anybody who wants to listen back can. Um, 
just to say to everybody, keep an eye out for our monthly webinars um, on a variety of topics. If you log on to our website, Evidence Synthesis Ireland, and sign up to our newsletter, you'll get notification in advance. But uh, while I think of it, the Campbell Collaboration are going to do a webinar for me in December on gap maps. Now, it's not advertised on our website yet because I advertise them as I have the details confirmed. But, but in principle, they've agreed that they'll do one. We're just trying to decide who will do it. So it'll be on the subject of gap maps. And uh, if anybody's interested in, in qualitative evidence synthesis, Andrew Booth is doing our next webinar on June the 13th. But you'll find all that information on the website or follow us on Twitter or whatever. And uh, just before I go, there's something in the chat room. Hold on. Oh, yeah, thank you from somebody. Uh, you're very welcome. So, so I think that's it. If nobody else has any questions, um, thank you all very much. And James, thank you hugely for that. It was really, really, really very interesting. And it looks like we have a whole new world in front of us. Um, of, of, of <laughs> and certainly it looks like crowdsourcing is, is, is going to be a really strong feature of the future, which I think is great. Yes, well, thank you very much for the invitation. And do email any questions you've got. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye now. Thanks. Bye.